We have the screens up here, uh, so you'll kind of see what we're doing. There are a few steps we'll skip, but more or less, I'm going to try to do a start to finish. Uh, we, we don't have the coordinates yet. So say this is somebody who's already undergone their MRI. They've had their CT scan done with their fiducial box, and we've marked out our rods here. And these are rods from our cadaver with a real uh, live human's uh, MRI. So there's our slice error of 0.53. Check. We verify that. And the slice, the MRI has already been formatted uh, to the uh, ACPC. Uh, and once you have the ACPC, you've kind of defined an axle, but then the head can be oriented anywhere around that. So then you pick three midline points, one, two, three, to kind of define how, how the sort of ear should be oriented, that the head's not cockeyed. So once we have that, we have our T1 MRI. There's our CT scan. And let's see, that's a proton density. And here is a T2. So I think what we're going to do here is a uh, right subthalamic nucleus. Come in. That's our left side. So here I've used the uh, direct targeting. This is a red nucleus. There's a subthalamic nucleus. Uh, we're at 12 millimeters lateral here. Uh, I'll round up uh, to, you know, nearest quarter millimeter, whatever difference that makes. Uh, I think it does make a difference, but uh, so two millimeters uh, uh, behind uh, the mid control point and four millimeters deep. So that's our target. And looking back at our T1, making sure we have a good safe trajectory that avoids the ventricle, try to stay off the ventricle by uh, about four millimeters. And basically, once we get in, we hit the uh, gyrus and we stay in. Yeah. So once you pick your target, which is X, Y, Z, and you pick your trajectory, which is uh, your entry point, which is defined by the ring and arc, we're all set with our coordinates. So these are our coordinates for the right side. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and start setting up our frame uh, for these coordinates. So X, Y, Z defines the target, and then ring and arc define the uh, entry point. All right, so we got one of these. So this would be uh, our Y is 112. With this system, you kind of got to keep an eye right on the side so you don't get any parallax. 112 on Y, and Z is 106.5. This is where human error can definitely be a factor, and it's good to have somebody double check. Let's check, check, double check, triple check. 112 for our Y, and 106.5 for our Z. So in the lab, these frames always have like, you know, 0.2 millimeter error, and then in real life, they're advertised for something like three millimeter error. So the goal is to kind of minimize that in vivo error, uh, so it's as close as possible to what you get sort of outside of the body. And you'll see with these, if we got a scan, just the dead tissue itself, it becomes so uh, non-compliant that we get more errors in a, in a cadaver than we would in a human. So our arc, so this is a semicircle, is 82.3. Okay. And our x, and again, this is one of those things that's good to be comfortable with a particular system, because you got to, the Lexel frame is actually made so you can put it like this, you can put it like that, you can put it like this, you can put it like that. And Depending upon how you orient it, you've got to pick the right Y or X, and you've got to pick the right set of numbers up or down. So this is uh, lat right, correct? And the X is 84.2. Yeah. All right, so now we've got our X, Y, Z, and our arc. The only thing left is our ring. So it's got a little notch to line it up on both sides. Loosen this, keep some tension, and it clicks in. Let's see, this one's still locked. This one's got to bring it back up. There you go. So keeping that in. 
we're in. Okay. Make sure everything's kind of. So again, a lot of room for little gaps that can affect your accuracy. Make sure everything looks flush. And then our last coordinate is the ring, 54.7. Four point seven. Okay. A little bit anterior on our cadaver. Okay. So once you have that, uh, assuming you know accuracy of fusion, and everything, uh, you can. Uh, I will often almost go in blind because I know that with the ring arc X Y Z, we should be sitting right on a gyrus, avoiding a blood vessel. I use contrast MRI to make sure of that. So this is a. Uh, Sharp tip stylet that I use. Uh, this is nice for puncturing dura. I'll actually use monopolar on this uh, right on dura uh, and keep it there for like 15 seconds to really kind of let all that dura melt away. But we'll use this to plan our entry point. Uh, I've got a little pen here. And I'll use a medicine cup once I make that little dot. And a medicine cup kind of has the perfect diameter for our burr hole and stim lock and gives you a nice semicircle, but I'll just kind of make it like that. So I use a flap, uh, and you'll see I use a flap and I'll countersink, and the flap really heals nicely. Um, obviously we prep and drape in the usual sterile fashion. Uh, so we'll make our incision. In this, this way, our incision is specifically planned so we, we're really right where we want to be for our burr hole. Okay, there we go. Get a little Wheatlander retractor. Don't have to deal with the haircut here. All right. Lock that in. Good. All right. And now we're going to go back and remark our entry point before we drill. And once I use the perforator, I'm going to switch to a burr. Okay, I can use our sharp tip stylet again. Right there. Okay. And this is where I might want to wear a mask, especially for the, uh, let's see. How's that? All right. All right, we're ready to go. Get some uh, irrigation. Get some of that stuff off, and I'll take the, yeah, whatever you got there. Maybe maybe a wet sponge will be a good way to start. All right. All right. Now we've got our bone dust off, just so we can create more bone dust with our countersinking. So, uh, you know, this thing's been around for a while, but it has a profile and. If you see somebody who's been countersunk versus not countersunk, it makes a huge difference. Great, thank you. All right, so we've marked out. I usually I'll use a sterile pencil for this step. And I'm so used to having a suction in my other hand, but <laughs> thank you. All right, so then uh, for the countersinking, just a little few minutes for aesthetics. I go right on the mark. And this is, uh, again, where I'm going to get CJD one day from getting all this bone dust in my eyes. Okay, I'm going to irrigate a little bit. And then when I do get CJD, you can say, he called it during the Seattle Swedish course. Draw at the bottom. Now just kind of level everything out.
All right, let's see. See that little rim down there? I'll take that out with the uh, burr, the little rim that they leave behind with the perforator to protect it. All right. And with a curette, just kind of make sure that any remnants are gone. There. Now we're ready to place the stim lock on. There it is. And one thing is, uh, it's nice not to, uh, it's good not to tighten the stem lock all the way. I'll wait to do that for the end. And that's just because the uh, little clip that you put in has these fine little tines that need to slip underneath the stem lock. So once we countersink, the stem lock may be flushed with the bone and there won't be that room. And then you're kind of stuck trying to figure out how to stick that thing in place so it doesn't move. All right, so now we're all ready for the lead. We're gonna put the cannula in and make sure blood pressure looks good before we put it in. You know, there's kind of three, there's four, there are four things I, I tell the fellows at Barrow that we think about with um, during the operation to kind of keep out of trouble and have good outcomes. Uh, CHIA is my the acronym. Uh, circuitry, you know, how we handle the hardware. Uh, the hardware can break and then you find yourself with a bad lead. Uh, after surgery, let's see, I don't need this anymore because I'm not gonna drill. So circuitry, so uh, really taking care of the hardware, don't taking, not taking it for, a, for granted. Uh, hemorrhage, uh, so you know, blood pressure control and really kind of slowing down and thinking about that step as you uh, put things in the brain. At this step, I would monopolar this like 15 seconds, just let it keep going. Eventually, that little spark keeps widening and widening and eventually you can see a little bit of CSF and you're done. Uh, and then I'll go in and uh, once I get that, then I'll pinch, uh, poke the, uh, the pia so once I've opened the dura, I'll go a little bit further and uh, uh, puncture the pia. The pia can be like cellophane, depending on how old the patient is. Uh, sometimes it can be very tense that you really have to make sure you're through it. Otherwise, you can end up poking that brain in a couple centimeters before it finally pops and uh, penetrates into the, uh, uh, the brain. So we've got that. So this is something I do with a monopolar, would be go in and kind of make a cruciate incision just gentle, just to make sure that uh, we have no deflection. Yeah. And now we go to our cannula. But yeah, that sharp tip stylet is very nice for that. Now we go to the cannula. Uh, the setup, just like the XYZ ring and arc, uh, there's also kind of the defined uh, distance from the platform to the middle of the brain. It's about 19 centimeters when everything's kind of set at zero. So you kind of know that to kind of adjust. This cannula is made to end 20 millimeters above target, so you can do microelectric recording. So I've advanced this 20 millimeters deep, so that in, um, when you're just doing stereotactic uh, uh, targeting without recording or test stimulation, I bring the cannula all the way to target instead of ending two centimeters above. Okay, and then I'll get a little Penfield one, which usually fits just perfectly through this little hole. And then my micro drive is set at uh, 10 would put me at target. I put it at 13.75, which basically means that for an STN, I'm targeting uh, the middle of contact one, which is the second contact up at target. So I have one below. Okay, so that's in. And now we are ready for our lead. Again, part of the circuitry, you know, chia circuits, hemorrhage, you know, we just put this in, kind of taking a pause, taking it easy as the, uh, as the uh, cannula goes in. Uh, circuits, I always check impedance for the system before we uh, take the stylet out. Uh, so that's CHI is infection, uh, so just, we, we take a lot of steps to avoid infection. Time is one of them. Um, you know, the longer a patient's exposed, the more exposure to the risk of infection. We've been using these antimicrobial uh, envelopes. Uh, and then A is accuracy. So, you know, I tell patients, you don't leave surgery without uh, a lead within two millimeters of my target, assuming the assumption being that the target I picked is the correct target. So, CHIA, circuit, hemorrhage, infection, and accuracy. 
And we really don't see many issues with wound. I'm raising the cannula now. At this point, we can uh, connect the adapter and um, run an impedance check. Uh, sometimes in our uh, cases under general anesthesia, we'll also ramp up voltage just to see at what point we start seeing lip contraction, hand grips, neck, uh, some sort of capsular effect. It's nice to see something just as verification that we're within spitting distance of the uh, internal capsule. Uh, so once that's up, we place our little clip. We call for CT. This one's... Even with that. Yeah, even with that, I'm surprised that this is not going in as easily. All right, there we go. And then you close it. That's not in correctly, but for, all in for the sake of this, that's fine. All right, so we put our little clip, mark it, and call for CT, and uh, we're going to not do that step. But then we go scrub out and verify on our uh, MRI that we hit our target. Um, once we know that, We'll take out the stylet, making sure we don't injure the circuit. One thing I always tell uh, everybody, all my scrubs know, do not touch my hardware. Uh, the, uh, I peel the device open. You know, We don't have the device sitting open on, on the field uh, while we operate. It's uh, only when we need it. We switch gloves before we, we're ready to handle the, uh, the internal pulse generator. OK. And then usual steps for closure. But yeah, with the flap and with the countersinking, you know, the other uh, issue would be uh, post-operative wound issues, and we really haven't seen those. Uh, I'll pour some vancomycin powder into the uh, the pocket that we tunnel uh, posteriorly, uh, about 500 uh, milligrams for the stage, uh, as well. You know, that's our pixie dust. So, and that's uh, that's that's how we do uh, that's what do our lead placements.